welcome to the fourth episode of Talking Esports. Just quickly, I'd like to apologize for the delay. We were just running a couple of tests before the show started, and uh, that took a little longer than we expected. My name is Contact Zero, and I'm your host for the night. Well, actually, I'm the host every week for the night, but I'm sure you know what I mean. My lovely guest tonight is, well, I've got a bit of an echo there. There we go. My lovely guest tonight is Billy Rag, aka Nutri, and this week I'm going to try something a little different with the format. I'm going to give you all a little breakdown of some of the topics we'll be discussing in the show tonight. So with Billy, I'll be just get there discussing his life as a player, his transition into becoming a coach slash analyst, and what's happening with him now. And then from there, we'll be talking about the ESL UK Premiership. If you think it's a good idea to include this sort of information at the start of every show, let me know and I'll continue doing this for future episodes. If not, well, we'll just pretend this never happened. <laughs> Without further ado, hello Billy, how are you? Um, I'm okay, a little bit ill, but I'm fine. Oh. Right, so with you, Billy, I'd like to start with Carnage Esports and i okay. I mean, this is roughly <clears throat> two and a half years ago. I'm not going to mm -hmm. ask you to go into like huge amounts of details about the event if you don't want to, but do you remember your play back then? Were you a good player? Um, okay. Short answer, I was a bad player, but I improved a lot in a short space of time, I guess. Like, leading up to ISOs, I was like plat 5 for the majority of the time. Um, and then I think two weeks, two weeks before the qualifiers for that insomnia, um, I was I was plat five, and then like leading up to that, in the in those two weeks, I went from plat five to diamond two, I think. So I like kind of became an irrelevant player to like being able to play the game competently ish. Fair enough. Um, in that period of time, um, the event itself was. I mean, we we got fifth to eighth at an eighty something team event, which was the biggest I series. Yeah, yeah. So, so how... it was it was okay. Yeah, so how did you actually manage to, like, form the team? Oh, um, I can't remember, actually. I think that I, I, I knew I knew one of the players from, like, the I think it was through, like, the old forums. That's how people used to form, like, the, in quotes, like, bad teams. Yeah. Like, if you didn't know anyone, you kind of just went to the forums because there wasn't really any other system in place. I normally knew each other because there weren't many events that had happened yet. So the only people that knew each other were the people that were already at the top, like Dig and Anime and teams like that. Yeah, fair enough. So as you said, you obviously placed like between fifth and eighth. Yeah. And then from there, you moved on to per Perilous Rift at after that event. Is there any particular yeah. reason that you guys couldn't have stuck together to play on? I mean, apart, apart from obviously Hado, who you played on with in Perilous as well. Um, okay, so what happened was certain players on the team of Carnage thought that at the next event they played at, like, they wanted to come top two, and they thought that they would best, like, they all individually thought that, but they thought that they would do it without each other. So then everyone split off to think that, you know, they were going to win the next one, um, whereas, you know, me and Haddo were the, the only ones to do that. Fair enough, fair enough. Do you remember what Hado was like as a player back then? Um, he was a top laner with a small champion pool, if we if we say that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. I think he played Shen. He was pretty much a Shen one trick, and then he'd want to play Trindamir every game. But we, we never let him. Fair enough. I mean, oh, is... Shen and Renekton, that was it. This is what, season three? Was it season three? This was season three, yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. So at that at I fifty, you managed to get mm -hmm. into the finals with Perilous. And yeah. you come up against FM Esports. Of course, mm -hmm. at the time you wouldn't have been able to know that you would be playing with them for so long, like it's saying like about a year later. <laughs> What yeah, were your yeah. thoughts of FM back then, and obviously especially Tundra, who you ended up playing with for so long? Um, okay, so the FM at the time were like a mixed team. Um, so it wasn't actually like a real team, but they were they were good enough to theoretically stomp that event. Um, so, I, I mean, my opinion was just that they were better than us, and it would be pretty hard to win. Like We were, we were expecting to get like top four that event, but we just 
it just happened that we kind of beat everyone. Um, and then, I mean, Tundra, I, I didn't really know him at that point. I didn't know much about him. I just known that he'd been on the good teams. Like he was always on the the team getting the finals, I guess. So I, I kind of just expected to lose in the back of my mind. Do you remember the final at all? Because, I mean, it was a 3-2 victory Yeah, I remember it guys. really well. Yeah. Um, I remember it, like, really, really well. So, um, yeah, so what happened then? Okay, so we were 2-0 down in the best of five. So we had to win three in a row to win. And my entire team, like all of us, were basically raging at each other in the fi- like, mid-finals. Um, I think, like, I missed an Olaf key one of the games, and Abaddon, the AD, like, literally shouted at me. Like, like Fuller just, like, shouted at me and, like, swore at me and stuff. Um, so it wasn't the best environment to play a finals in. But I ended up going, I think I went, I might be wrong, I went Legendary in two out of the three games, or three out of the three. I'm not sure. But in my mind, like, from my perspective, I basically hard-carried all three games, although, like, other people played really well too, obviously, but I, like, really stepped up. Do you think they could have, like, do you think them, well, you winning the third game was the pinnacle, like, turning point for you to then win the fourth and fifth game? Did, did things calm down after the third game, or were, was everyone still raging at everyone, even though it, that you were starting to bring things back? Um, we still hated each other, but we were like, hmm... It was kind of, like, we knew we could win, despite the fact that we were all thinking that the others, like, the other people, everyone thought that everyone else was bad on the team, if that makes sense. Yeah. Like, every individual felt like they were the best, um, barring maybe myself and maybe Haddo. So, it was, like, our morale and, like, our mindset was definitely still not in a good place after the first game, but after the second one, we were like, oh, wait, like, you know, we can, you know, we can actually win. And then the third game, we kind of all, like, shut up and just try harder. Fair enough. Okay, well, the next point I want to jump to, then, is skipping Epic 12 when you were on Infuse for a very short period of time and going straight Mm -hmm. to I-51 when you played for Rain Esports. And again, you were in the finals, but this time you were against Unicorns of Love, who at the time Mm -hmm. had Vishachashi, Vardags, Helixang, and two other players. Like, what do you remember of these guys at the time back uh, then? Do you remember playing that I-Series at all? Yeah, I remember. I remember that really well, too. Um, the other two players were Zodias and Sheepy. Yeah. Um, so, that event was a really good one, actually, and one that we truly should have won. So, obviously, going into it, we don't expect to beat UOL. We kind of expected to be playing for second. However, after, like pre-20ing every team that talked before the event, if that makes sense. Like, Infused talked us down, obviously, as they always do. Um, said they were going to, you know, I can't remember what they said. They said something about, like, our mid and support not being on, like, the same level as theirs, when I think our digger at the time, our mid laner, was top 10 in solo queue. Like, this is towards, like, the mid mid to late stages of a season as well. Or, like, the mid stages, I think. So, like, he wasn't just top 10 at the start. He was actually a top 10 player. Yeah. Um, so after we, like, I, I think we generally, we only had one close game leading up to ULL, which was against uh, Enigma, which was Snitch, who plays Heroes now, and Talamos and people like that, Talamos from Perilous, um, and Proper Panda, who's still around, mm, Yeah. and it was their team. So we, we had, like, a close series against them, but we 2 0 them, I think. And then we were playing ULL in the winners' finals, and we managed to, I think we lost the first game, and then we won two in a row. So we two won, so we two won them in the winners' finals. So then they went down to losers and played against, I think, FM, uh, which was with Yero, uh, Kissing, uh, Samwise, Tundra, and that, uh, like that team. Yeah. I think they, they had a close game against them, but managed to win, and then we played them in the finals, and... We really, really should have won that finals. We played it awfully. We choked on stage, to be honest. Right, okay. So what do you think you could have done differently to enable you to get that victory against them then? Um, much we just didn't really... Uh, yeah, I mean, we weren't really... Uh, we were kind of just playing their game. Like, they picked Carthus in the, in the game that beat us. Like, you know, the game, the final game. Um, and we kind of just 
said that that was okay and just went and team fought them over and over, even though they had cast out. I think we had like three dragon fights in a row, which is just completely unnecessary. We could have just won by scaling and like abusing the fact that Carthus has low range, but we just didn't do it. I also had Nocturne, which is like a scaling late game counter to Carthus at the time. And I just didn't didn't use it. Like we just kept fighting them over and over because it felt like the right thing to do. What did you think of Sheepy as a jungler back then? Because obviously he's the manager now. I I think that that was probably one of the key defining moments in why he got benched was that event. Um, I I think that he was a bit out of place. Like he was clearly like I might be wrong, but it seemed like he was shot calling for them. So he was telling them what to do, and he was good at that. But he was often getting caught himself. I, I think a lot of the games he was exceeding 10 deaths or hitting around the area. Mm. Um, which is obviously far too many. Yeah, far too many. <laughs> <laughs> 10 too many, some might say. Um, yeah. So at this point, it's a year on from Carnage Esports. You've mm -hmm. been on five teams in just one year. I mean, this seems to be quite the standard in the UK scene and teams in general that they just shuffle around after every event. Like, why did this happen for you, and why do you think this happens in general? Um, so, at least the mindset back then, I'd say there were, there were more, maybe I'm wrong by the way, but it felt like there were more things going on back then. And so, you want to win every event, and also your time frames aren't exceptional, but you don't want to stay with the same team. So what happens is there's a lot of, at least they used to be, really quick shuffles around teams. Like, it all happened incredibly fast. Like, every every single change was maybe overnight or over, like, a two-day span. Um, it, was, it was incredibly quick. And the reason for that was just that people wanted to get playing again as soon as possible, but they wanted the winning roster. Um, the money wasn't that great, but the only way to make any meaningful amount of money was to come first. And it was it was pointless to try and go without a roster that could come first place because, firstly, you won't get any support. Like way more teams now are supported financially than back then. And it's basically at back then it was close to impossible to secure funding unless you were winning events. Thankfully, I had the Insomnia Fifty win, which basically banked me support for the rest of like the lands I went to. Yeah, but. The, the shuffling is just a result of there being no salaries. Uh, there's no reason to stay with the team. You know, you need to win the events to make money, so you have yeah. to do what it takes to win the next event. Do you not think actually sticking together with, a, say, maybe a top four team and trying to actually get synergy and improve everyone together to try and obviously become a top one team is better than saying just go and grab five people every event and hoping that you'll come first? Well, I think that that, to an extent, is what we had in Rain. We played together for actually quite a long period of time, and we were playing like five, six hours a day. That was an example where, I mean, it's still not the greatest example, because we were all high in solo queue. Like, we were all Diamond 1, 50 points plus, which at the time was considered, like, you know, you're decent-ish. Um, but if, if you're talking like a lower team that say like with like a, a weak link of like say a diamond three player or something, then it, it's hard to stay together. And because e like even if you build the synergy, once you come up against any of like the, I don't know how to put it, the star teams, I guess, with like the really good players, that weak link is likely to be too weak for you to have a reasonable chance of winning. Yeah. Just because like, let's say it's your top laner. And let's say he's going up against like Tundra or Numlocked at the time, like if you travel back in time a bit. Yeah. You just know that like there's nothing you can really do to stop him basically feeding. Yeah. Like yeah. within reason, because they're just too far ahead. Yeah, and I obviously if it becomes a two v two, then you've also lost that as well. So it, you can't well, yeah. really help him either. So yeah. Yeah, that makes sense, I mm. guess. Okay. So moving on from there, we get to roughly around mid two thousand and fourteen. You played for a team called Team Mercenaries, and yes. you played versus UOL in a Challenger mm -hmm. Series game. Like, yes. How did this setup occur? Because I don't think a lot of people <coughs> know this about you. I had to dig quite deep to find this information. So, yeah. so tell us a little bit about that. Um, well, there isn't actually that much to it. it was, I was just looking for a team at the time. I had nothing to do. And we basically made a solo queue mix and just... 
I think we played maybe five. No, some days we were playing up to eight hours, and we just grinded the ladder and got into the qualifiers. And then we got a default first game because the other team didn't show. And then second game was UOL, and we just got dumpstered. Um, but the, the way it all happened was there wasn't really damage to it. You know, we just we were just so lucky players, and we just played ladder and just were kind of good enough to qualify. So, at what point did UOL approach you? Was it was it after this series? Was it them noticing you from the the I series before? Like, how did that situation occur? Okay, so one of the things that caused Rain to fall apart was that UOL were asking me to scrim for them, like to sub. Um, because they had Dan at the time. Wait, I think yeah, yeah, okay. I think they had Dan at the time, and something was going on with him. Um, so they needed me to sub in a few times. Yeah. And then those times went well. I, I can't remember who we scrimmed. I think it was like Millennium, uh, NIP, teams like that. Um, and that went pretty well. And then it came up that Dan couldn't go to the Cohen qualifiers due to his college stuff. Like his parents wouldn't let him go or something. So he had to like step down and they had to find a replacement. Um, as far as I'm aware, they only approached me and Gilius. Yeah. Um, and then we both had like a, a tryout and I guess they preferred me. And then that was pretty much it. But the, the approaching was I can't remember the exact time frame, but it was before it was quite af- it was quite long after that because they'd played through to the qualifiers, like to the promotion tournament. They actually approached me at the promotion tournament, but I had subbed for scrims for them in the past. Okay. So what happened in the scenario where you weren't actually able to, like Dan wasn't able to go with them, you also weren't able to go, and instead, therefore, they picked Gilius for their... Um, well, it's, it, there's a bit more to it in that I actually went to Cologne. Yeah. Like, they didn't realise that I couldn't play until I was there. Right, okay. So, yeah, af- after that, that was what happened. I wasn't eligible because because of the Mercenaries game. Right, okay. Because I'd played for another team, I wasn't eligible to play for them. Right, okay, that's interesting then. That's, that's, <laughs> so that, so, yeah, it's actually bad that I qualified for that Challenge yeah, Series. Yeah, of course. So what do you think would have happened if you could have played for UL in that series instead of Gilius? Could that have like changed the entire outcome of your career? I mean, it could have made it worse, I guess. <laughs> like I could have went zero ten. But given how I was playing at the time, like given the fact that I obviously went out in the trial process and the fact that I don't think I ever really lost matchups against Cotton X uh, and Q are two that stand out. Like, I was consistently doing fine versus players. And, yeah, I mean, I think I would have... It's hard to say. You can't really say if you would have won or lost. I'd like to think we would have had a good chance, but at the same time, I think there were moments where Gilius played really well and kind of, like, persevered through. Like, he was doing a lot of things wrong, like, a lot. But at the same time, he had the confidence to make like risky plays that maybe I don't think I would have done. But at the same time, I think we would have won some games harder because of the control style that I had, in that like I heavily facilitated uh, power of evil. Okay. Whereas like Gilius was more of just a spam gank kind of player. So how do you feel about like the ordeal now that it's obviously well about a year and a half afterwards? Do you ever think about it, thinking, well, maybe that could have been me, or do you just think, oh, well, just missed opportunity, doesn't matter? Um, it's a mixture, I guess. Uh, it's it's annoying being so close to the point of, like, actually travelling and everything. Yeah. Um, you know, because you feel like you're actually going to get a chance. But I, I don't think that it's... I don't think that it was out of my control in that, like, it all went a little bit downhill, because... I definitely could have networked better while I was there and could have spoken to teams and stuff, yeah. which I didn't do. Yeah. Um, so I didn't really... I, I basically kind of just was a bit defeated when I found out, I guess. Yeah. So how come they... I mean, they obviously took Gilius for that series, 
could, mm-hmm. did they ever approach you afterwards or were they just content with having Gilius and then that was the end of the story? Um, no, after they qualified with Gilius, they actually trialed like a bunch of players. Like, they trialed, I won't say certain names because obviously, like, some of it's unknown, but they trialed current or ex LCS players as well as like Kickers who got the spot in the end. They basically only wanted a jungler for the promotion tournament, and then unless they that jungler performed exceptionally, I think they planned to replace them anyway. Yeah, okay, fair enough. So afterwards, uh, I-52, or well, maybe a little bit before I-52, you joined FM Esports. Is there any particular reason why you decided to join FM Esports over anyone else? Did you have any other offers? Mm. Well, I think the issue was that you know, because I didn't network and everything, I didn't really get anything out of... If anything, I lost out because I was basically the reason that Rain disbanded. Because of the Unicorns of Love thing. Yeah. So the team kind of fell apart after I started doing that. So the FM decision was... I, I don't know. I don't think... Looking back, I'm not sure if it was the best decision to play on a team at that time. Like, I, I, I think I should have maybe stayed away from teams. But at the same time, I knew that on that roster, we would get first place at most events. Yeah. So, it it was my only offer, but I, I don't know if, you know, maybe I could have done more by just grinding solo queue and hoping to get noticed by a higher team. But that at the time, it was very, very rare for people to be picked up from solo queue. It's becoming a little bit more common now. Yeah. But it was so rare. Yeah, I do remember. I, I'm, I'm just trying to think of people that it happened to. I can't even think of any off the top of my head, actually. No, no, it was it was incredibly difficult. Like Dig, Digger, like I said, was always looking for other opportunities, and he was top ten, and he couldn't he couldn't for the life of him get anything. Yeah. So from here, you win I fifty two, obviously. You win Gift Gaff, then I fifty three and Epic fifteen, like. What would you say your favourite experience as a player was? Um, we got third at I-53, by the way. Did you? Yeah. Oh, I thought you uh, were... Choke won I-53. Okay, my bad. Wait, yeah, 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 yeah they did. Because we, we got, we won, because Gifcalf was at the same time as I-53. We won Gifcalf, but we got third in I-53. Right, okay. Um, that's fine, then. <laughs> yeah, so what would you um, say your like, was... favourite experience as a player was, like, overall, like, during your... Well, from Carnage to F15. Okay, um... So this includes Gifgaf, yeah? Yeah. Okay, probably the finals, because Infuse talked, like, so much before that. Yeah, I do like, remember. Like, they said... Yeah, they were... I don't know, it was, it was crazy. And then, I, then the finals was just a joke. Like, I think both of the games were 20k gold leads in our favour. Well, like, sev- between 15 and 20k gold. Like, complete stomps overall. And it was just, like, a bit... I don't know. It was it was so nice. Like, it felt so good to win that. Yeah, I guess, and I was... like, Infuse were, like, kind of like your rivals because they always shit talk to you. Like, no matter what the yeah. event was, like, they always, always shit talk to you. So I guess it was a bit satisfying to beat them so so easily, was it? Yeah, I mean, that that's how it's... It's actually how it's always been. Like... Um, Insomnia 52 was the same story. Like, we, you know, we had the same thing happen again, where before the event, everyone does their, their usual talking and stuff. And, the, yeah, it's always, it felt better to be infused than it did to be refused, which were the, the European team that came over. Yeah. Because, you know, you got the rivalry and everything. It's, it's always nice. Yeah, yeah. So during this time, who was the shot caller for FM? Honestly, we never like had a concrete. It was it was pretty much me and Jamie though. Yeah. Like, I would I would do objectives. Jamie would do everything else, or like within reason. Like, but me and Jamie had systems where like we would override each other a lot, but it was fine. Like, if Jamie says something, but I say no, do this like really assertively, then he'll go with it and vice versa. Okay. Um, we had like a. Is there never a time when you say something and, and then he says something assertively and you go, no, 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 it, actually, we need to do this? Uh, kind of, yeah. But then in that system, like, it was, the hierarchy was actually quite set out in that, like, 
basically because it was so rare that, like, from my perspective, it was so rare that I would override him saying no to me. Yeah. But, like, if I did, then he knows that I'm serious or that I have a piece of information that maybe he isn't seeing and he'll just trust it. And kind of vice versa. Like, if I say no and then he's like, no, 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 do this, then I'll be like, okay, like, m- it must be right, you know? Yeah, fair enough. Okay. It was, it was, it, I don't think it ever happened where we disagreed in, like, a tournament game and, like, it, it went bad, ever. Like, we always figured it out within, like, half a second. Yeah, cool. Okay. So, I'm pretty sure I know the answer, but which team would you say you had the most fun on and why? Oh, most fun. Actually, a lot of it was... There was, like, a lot of stress in a lot of the teams overall. Mostly caused by myself, but... I would... Hmm. I did have a lot of fun on Rain, to be honest. But I, it's either Rain or it's FM with when we had Samwise and when I was playing support. Because we actually had like a really laid back roster overall. Like it was me, Samwise, Chris, who was like pretty casual but good. And like Jamie, and then we had uh, we had Dan for a, a period of time. He plays for Miles now. Yeah. Okay. So. Let's talk a little bit about the practice schedules or, or well, yeah, but let's talk a little bit about the practice schedules within FM uh, without obviously okay. going into too many details that you wouldn't obviously want to give out. But uh, like, what did you do to improve as a team, as players? Basically, what I'm asking is what was your daily schedule like as a player? Okay, so my, I actually had like the basically a, a pro schedule, if you want to call it that. In that, I woke up at mostly like eleven a.m. ish, maybe like maybe ten, maybe twelve, within within reason. Uh, for I'd either play a game or I just like wake up in general. Usually I'd play a game. Um, a scrim started at two p.m. GMT, so it was two till five. Would be one block, like just scrimming one team, and then we'd have a one hour break to like eat or whatever, and then you play. So the break is five till six. And then you play six to nine uh, scrims again. And then I would sometimes play solo queue afterwards as well. Who, and then rinse and repeat. Who set up the scrims? Like, how would you get these scrims? Like, is it just um, because you would, already knew people, so you just talked to, talk to certain people, or is there a certain specific way that you had to go about actually getting these scrims? Uh, there was a scrim channel for LCS and Challenger only on Skype. It ended up becoming a little bit populated, but on the whole, it was good. Um, just you, you don't need basically the the minimum level of scrim that you'll get is like a fifteenth place team on the ladder or something, or like twentieth place. So cool. that was a, a good system. So when you were with FM, then can mm-hmm. you tell me about some of the scr- like some of the teams you scrimmed? Like, who were your favourite? What people to scrim against? Like, who are your favorite junglers to scrim against, or play against? In, in general, maybe it was someone in the UK scene. Um, one that stands out, which was actually when I subbed for URL, was Gilius. Um, I know it's a different thing, but just like someone who stands out in that, like he actually would type in all chat and flame people in scrims. <laughs> okay. That that was always fun, but um, on FM, do you remember Chiefs who played at Worlds? The Australian team. I don't know, unfortunately. Okay. No. Well, they were one of the wildcard teams, and when they came over to EU, like we were their like go-to scrum partners. Okay. Um, and that that was that was really fun. Like they were really cool, and obviously like they were boot camping in I can't remember where they were, but they were somewhere in Europe. And I don't know. It was cool to play against like a team like that, you know. Yeah. I think we had we had some good. I can't remember our record versus them or anything, but they were really fun to play against. Were they really unique? Were they like like obviously was the meta over there slightly different, or did they mm-hmm. was it pretty standard to what Europeans or maybe Americans played? I might I might be misremembering this. I might be wrong, but I'm pretty sure every game was just like team fight comps. Like I think they really just liked kind of wombo press R stuff. Quite a simple way of playing the game, but yeah. I, it was it was like the scrims had a lot of kills in. That, that seems I prefer games like that. It's so much more fun yeah. when you just absolute bloodfest. Mm-hmm. 
Well, that comes out like that, actually. So, how do you actually prepare for games? Like, what's and what's the difference between like LAN events and online events? Um, LAN, the difference between LAN events and online is becoming like less and less as, as time goes on, and people generally get experience. But before you have experience, it's quite common for people to be like shaking and stuff while they play. Like I've I've definitely had this myself, and yeah. that that's like the difference. The di I think people also play more scared. So that that's actually a reason why a lot of the teams that are winning every event continue to win, because they're not scared. Any other team plays scared and do things that are like really simple to play against. For example, um. It was very. It used to be unheard of for lower teams to run, say, split push comps, and then whenever you're against the worst team, you just run like one three one or something, or like just in general, running one three run comps was like used to be like a go to way to just win every game. Yeah. You lane top and then you one three one, and you'll beat any UK team. That's how it used to be. Yeah, because no one knows how to how to do any, well to deal with it or how to do how to do it themselves as well. Yeah. Yeah. So there was never any risk against a lot of teams. Yeah, I do remember when I was on stage, um, my hands just being absolutely freezing cold. It was just mm -hmm. awful. For the first game, I just played like crap. But after like the nerves had gone from the first game, it was just so much better. But yeah, I just remember it being just really terrible. And one, like the first game was like one of the worst times of my life. But after the, in terms of playing anyway, and um, mm -hmm. the second and third games and any games after that. Um, was just so they, they were probably the best actually. Um, just playing on stage is not they can't, you can't compare uh, how good it is, like how good of a feeling it is compared to like playing online or even just sat with your mates. It's like just nothing. It's amazing. So yeah, it's, it's very nice to know that like in th when you do something, you know, like in three minutes time, you're gonna hear the crowd react. It's yeah, like... yeah, 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 definitely. So if someone was looking to get involved in the scene and wanted to try and become a professional player, what advice would you give to them? Hmm. That's definitely an, an interesting question. So I think that there's two things. Um, the first is to not tunnel on it too hard. Like, don't try and do it before you're ready. Because if you play bad like one event, you're quite unlikely to keep trying. Um, and at the same time, your first event you should always go into with little to no expectations. Because the only way to not choke in your first LAN, in my opinion, is to have no expectations and for it not to matter. Whereas if you go in it with expectations, then you're quite likely to choke. Like, I choked really hard at, um, the the first LAN I played was before Insomnia 49 and it was like a... The insomnia, the qualifier for it, had like a LAN at the end in London, like a mini LAN. Um, and playing that was like really bad for me. Like we lost both our games, um, and we just all like choked and played awful. And it was it was so alien to me to be like around my team in person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, like it was the first time I'd ever done anything like that, and I was like agoraphobic, seventeen year old, <laughs> like. Well, it's a good job to get it out of the way, the, the well, basically the event before I series, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it was still there during I series, but it was a little bit less. Mm -hmm. And because that I series, there was like, basically, you have to be, in order to actually improve and play to like a level good enough to ever stand a chance of winning, in my opinion, you have to have the ability to admit when people are better than you. So like, Going into events, it's never bad to look at a team and be like, okay, these guys will stomp us. Because it means that when you do play that team, you're going in it knowing that, like, okay, let's use, this is a really good example. Yeah, let's use the most recent I-Series. No, the one before the most recent. So, 55. Everyone, no one there expected to beat Dig apart from, say, EXN. They wanted to. Yeah. But when we played Dig, we knew that they should just 20 minute us both games. But it, it was it's really good to have that mindset because you then play in a way that like there's no pressure, so you just see if you can win. Yeah. But you don't care if you lose. So you play like you play aggressively, you try stuff, you don't just sit in your tower and like let them win. Which obviously if you're really trying to win, you're likely to do that because you're so scared to lose that you you don't want to lose. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Whereas you know 
we, we were fine to take like a level one, five man all in and go zero five. You know, it's fine. We don't care. Yeah, I mean that. Just going on from that point. Obviously, I played you once at I fifty four, possibly. I think. I was fifty four. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And uh, we knew that you were going to beat us, but it was just simple. It was just simply, we were like, well, we're just going to mess around and try our hardest to like just go all in all the time and yeah. just try to go crazy. And it ended up being like a really, really good game. Whereas if we were like, oh, maybe we can beat these guys, right? Play really safe guys. Like, don't mm -hmm. fight for dragons. Don't do anything. Just, just try and play around the map. No, we just, we just went in and just fought constantly. I think that was, I think that was a pretty high kill game actually. I think it was something crazy like 40 kills in 30 game, uh, 30 minutes or something that like that. Yeah, I think it took us like 45 minutes to win or something. It's quite quite a close game, yeah. yeah was, but that's that's exactly what I'm getting at, you know. Like you have to you have to know when a team's better. Even even if you accelerate the level and you look at say, let's use like a a real day example. Like let's say I'm trying to think about the most appropriate one. I want to say like. Choke versus Renegades, I guess. It's not the perfect example, and I'm not saying that Renegades should should like stomp Choke or anything, because like, it doesn't. It's not really the same. It's not like that. But at the same time, I don't think if I was on Choke, I would go in it with the expectation to have much of a chance. Even though, if you look at it from the outside, you can say like Choke have at least a twenty percent chance, for example. Yeah. But still, as a player, it is at times beneficial, in my opinion, to consider yourself worse or to realize it and to accept that you shouldn't win this game yeah okay so and just, I, yeah come on mm -hmm. sorry no it's fine you can go on okay so just going on from there then mm -hmm. we we're just talking about i-54 briefly the entire roster for fm went over to infuse for maybe like about a week i think like what and then after that, you went instantly back to FM. Like, what was the story behind this? Hmm. The the best analogy to use was that we the grass seemed a little greener on the other side, and it definitely was not. Okay. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> um, yeah. It was. Without going into too much detail, a lot of things were said that didn't necessarily seem to be true, so we kind of just got out. Well, you could. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. So going from on, going from there, we'll leave your time as a player. And actually, no. One last thing, for a brief mm -hmm. period, when we we spoke about it very briefly before, you transitioned from being a jungler to a support, and then back mm -hmm. to jungle. Like, why did this happen? Hmm. Okay. So it was specifically, it was two things. Firstly, it was a desire to play with a good AD. And I felt Samwise was really good at the time. And also, like, we really we really got on. Like, just talking about the game and stuff, like, he would listen to me. So I kind of... I don't think I micromanaged him as much as I could have, because I, I don't know why I didn't. But overall, I was. Just, like, I was able to do so. Like, I could say something to him and he would just do it. And it was kind of like playing... It was really fun because it was like playing two roles at once. Like I was, t I was, I kind of felt like I was playing AD, but like it was like playing StarCraft or something, where I like move him and then he attacks for me. Does <laughs> yeah. that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I, I enjoyed that kind of like idea and mindset, and I, I also just, it was also because there were junglers available and there weren't supports who we felt were good enough. So we, because we got Dan in jungle, who was like similar skill level to me at the time and we got you know then i just moved to support and we get like the in terms of minds we have like three on the team then we have tundra dan and me yeah. whereas if if say we got a random support it's still just two and the support is like an anomaly in that we we don't know what they're going to do we don't know if they're going to be consistent at least with me roll swapping we knew that it would lead to like consistent results so at that period then, like, did you ever consider, you obviously played with Haddo before, did mm -hmm. you ever consider ha getting Haddo as support or were you quite like, you really wanted to go to, to support because you can control so much from that area? Um, yeah, I mean it was just, it's, it just seemed like the only option for me to roll up to be honest. 
okay. for the team to continue to win everything. Or like with that being the intent. Yeah. Okay. So just like Sheepy, who we mentioned before, you transitioned from being a jungler to a coach. Mm-hmm. So you are or possibly were the coach for Newell Titans. Like what's the situation with that now and what happened? Like how did the <coughs> how did a role come about? Um, so firstly I think the teams it was pretty much set anyway that it was probably gonna disband if we didn't qualify for Prem. Yeah. Just because there was nothing to play for. Like it wasn't any it wasn't like there was any hard feelings or anything, there was just nothing to do. Yeah. So that just made sense, but the it wasn't really like a quick transition or anything. Like I was always coaching on the side anyway because the money in the UK wasn't great, so I needed some extra income. And it just made sense to kind of sell myself at a rate that was like would get people buying hours, but you know wasn't too expensive or anything. And I sold a decent amount of hours, and then um it was kind of I kind of tilted out of playing. And that's what led to the switch, rather than it being like some thing that like made a bunch of sense. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah. Like I didn't. I felt like I didn't have a choice at the time because I was just playing so bad, and I was just not finding it fun. So with that in mind, it just made sense to swap. But the New Titans position was there was a time where I was I was between teams, and what I was going to do was just coach anyone who would pay me. Yeah. Um, as in, like, I would basically end up coaching a lot of teams at the same time. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with this, because if no one's willing to pay for someone to be exclusive to them, then you can't complain. You can't complain about me helping other teams, right? Yeah, yeah, that's fair enough. I mean, like, because no one's forced to, to hire someone or to ha get someone's help. Like, you're not forced to let me do that. I mean, you're not forced. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not forcing myself on anyone in that way, so... Yeah. It felt ethically fine to do so, but then I eventually found like a an agreement where I would just coach one team, um, just for the the span of leading up to ESL Prem and the qualifiers. And wait, that that was the question, right? Yeah, like, that's pretty much it? the question. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So as you mentioned, you do coaching on the side as well. Like, what particular areas do you coach? Are you more on macro level, pick and bands? Like early game, like what what would you say is your like your speciality? Um, do you mean with the individuals here? Yeah, or individuals team? or teams. Let's go, let's go through both. All right. Okay. So with teams, it's mostly not mostly, but I've got a good portion of it is understanding picks and what they're meant to do. So, like example, whenever you have a Fiora, you need to play like a a wave control split push style because otherwise you're kind of wasting one aspect of, of the pick. Um, that would be like one thing to do with teams. And a lot of it is just like organizing for them, organizing the game for them in that you give them a means to win by giving them a good draft. Um, you explain to them how they can win the game. And then instead of, I mean, I guess I was kind of micro as well, like individual builds, individual build paths, um, approaches and things like that. I wasn't, I don't think it's too beneficial to do like a bunch of macro coaching with these teams. Just because I think most of the things that they're doing wrong can't be fixed by teaching macro. I think by teaching macro, you can just kind of bombard them with information. And they're just going to kind of sit there and agree with you and be like, they're going to take in the information, but it will never be applied. Yeah. If that makes sense. Like, you can't just tell them like, oh, you need to board here and here. Like, just, just say that. You can't just... It just doesn't really work. Like they'll just all the coaches that have just talk about wards and stuff. It never really works. Um, I, I'm obviously I'm not like an expert on why that is. I mean, I've been on the receiving end of it, and I've, you know, I've seen it so many times. I've been on teams with it. Well, I, I think it's because when a coach like is just telling you things, you just kind of let it go in and then just put it aside a bit. Um, so I I, I think that. It's good to just keep the information concise, but when I coach one to one, it is probably I try to say seventy percent macro, thirty percent micro. In that the macro including any decision made leading like I don't include um, say a skill shot. I don't think that's always a micro thing. 
in terms of like I, I just I just see macro as like your mindset and your thought at that time. So I mostly focus on that rather than looking at an individual small misplay and saying like, oh, you should have like, you should have hit this guy or something. Like it's, yeah. it's much different because what you what you're wanting to do when you coach one to one is in, increase an individual's win rate. You're not trying to make you're not trying to like just tell them what to do. You're trying to give them the tools they need to get a better win rate. So that they can then like that, that's that's what they're paying you for, right? So the best way to do that is to just focus on their thoughts and how they can change their thoughts to increase their win rate. Okay. So without giving away any of your like trade secrets, so to speak, what would some of your tips be to improve as like a player or in a team or in solo queue? Mm, probably to not get attached to picks. And just be willing to play what's OP. Yeah. So an example of this would be like there's people who love to play Anivia mid, uh, Singe top, you know, stuff like that. Yeah. Um, I'd say that while that's fine, I'm not saying that that's wrong. Um, but let's say you love playing Zed and you're like a silver three player. Um, as a silver three player, you're not going to be very good at fully utilizing Zed kit. So it's going to be hard to get like a good win rate with them. Yeah. Whereas if you just play like a simple strong champion, let's say Lux is like a great example right now. By just playing Lux, you don't even have to be as good at Lux, but you can do a lot while you're still not as good. Yeah. But I, I think a lot of it is that it's hard to acknowledge that maybe you're like in in quotes like not good. Right. Okay. Um, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um. So. You talk a lot about analysis on both Twitter and Twitch chat during games. Like, is this something you'd prefer to do, like full time instead of playing? And like, which one would you prefer to do? Um, I think, given the offers that I've had and stuff, I think I'd prefer to play. Like, the only way I would coach or analyze would be if it was at a level higher than what I feel I can achieve, like playing. So like I wouldn't want to analyze or coach for like the UK scene right now, or even like the low challenger scene probably. The only way I would like coach or analyze would be for like an LCS team really. That's pretty much pretty much it. Do you think that you need to if like if you want to do that? Do you think you need to coach some of these teams to get there, or are you basically hoping that say like if you did videos or, <coughs> or something else that you might actually get to to coach those teams? Um, coaching is nearly impossible right now. It just it just is. But analysis, um, I don't really need to do that much. It's mostly just about displaying knowledge and talking to people. I guess talking to the right people. Yeah. Okay. Right. So you've obviously spoken to George in the past two was an analyst for Fnatic and is now on TSM as like mm -hmm. the, the head coach. What was he like? Did like, How much did those discussions with him help you make your decision making during games? And did, it, did those discussions improve your like analyst skills? And do you think that's like, I mean, I'm asking, I'm asking a lot of questions here, but do you think it's like a key element to improvement as an analyst, to talk to others, to have like really in-depth conversations, or do you think you can learn by yourself? Um, I think it's a mixture. I think that it's good to have someone to talk to who you can trust, and that you know that they're not like not always right, but within reason. They can like say things that will really question what you believe. Um, I, I spoke, to, uh, yeah, I spent a lot of time speaking to him, and it was always. It was always like eye opening to uh, basically discuss and like I don't I don't know how to word it, but it's kind of like you're kind of like fighting with each other in like a nice way, where yeah. like you're both carrying each other's points over and over and over um, until I mean a lot of the time in these discussions with people, it's very rare that the two people will end up agreeing. Yeah. But the point is that you you generally will both learn through considering the other's thoughts. Because there's the respect there in what they're saying, like you trust that they know what they're talking about, you then start to question your own beliefs, which is obviously a very good thing. 
like questioning your own thoughts and beliefs is really good in such a in a game such as this where the, like things are quite rarely completely black and white. Yeah. Like there are always answers or responses, but at the same time there are some situations where there aren't as many answers and aren't as many responses, and that's what you kind of like look to discover. So so through him I I did learn that like I I I, I just. I guess I just learned how to question things and how to come to conclusions and then went from there, like, learning myself. Okay. So, again, I've asked you about advice as a player, but this time, for someone who wants to improve at being either, or maybe even just get into the role, like, getting into the role as a coach or analyst or improvers as that role, what advice would you give to them? Um, I would say not to think, not to ever think that you're right in a way, in that you should never be forceful with ideas or thoughts unless you're really confident. But then you shouldn't be confident unless you're backed up by like your own credentials or history or anything like that, if you know what I mean. Like, you can't just say that something is like something or that a team or a player should do something without a lot of evidence and backing behind what you're saying. So, like, for example, um, whenever you're making points about... Let, let's, let, let's look at, like, scouting reports. If you're scouting out an enemy team, you can't just say that, like, oh, they ward this place, or, oh, they do this by watching one game. You need to have, like, a, a stockpile of evidence. Um, and I think that, you know, sometimes people will... While there are conclusions that you can draw from watching one game, I think that it's quite hard to train yourself to find what those things are that you can draw away. And I don't think it's something where you can just say what it is. Like, I think it's a skill that you just have to train. And, like, you have to learn through being wrong multiple times. Yeah, okay. So, given the current state of the UK scene, do you think analysts and coaches are important slash necessary? Um, I think I have a very unpopular opinion here. Um, I don't think many people agree with me, but I don't think that below a certain level, I think below top four in ESL, I don't think it's beneficial to have a coach or analyst on the whole, within reason. Um, you know, I, I say within reason, because if the person's like qualified or has a long history of it, then it's fine. But I think that a lot of the teams just kind of pick people up, um, specifically coaches who have like a huge influence. Um, they pick up people who are going to have a huge influence on these players when I think a lot of these players would be better off just learning by themselves. Yeah, okay. And just kind of being left to the, their own devices. I mean, I think that coaches are good if they... They either need to be really knowledgeable or they need to not talk about the game at all and just keep the team like together, if you know what I mean. But I think that a lot of the time it can be bad for a team to have someone telling them things about the game and then they trust him and then he's wrong. Yeah, okay. And then, you know, they, they could have done better by themselves. Yeah. So just moving on for slightly before we go on talking about the UK Premiership. Mm-hmm. Who would you say is the top two, top three UK players in each role at the moment? Okay, um, I'll start from the bottom up. So support, there's got to be, I mean, it's pretty much just looking at UK only. Well, no, the top three, okay. So there's um, there's Adam, who I would say, hmm, I'd say Adam is third from a team perspective, but mechanically, he's exceptional. Um, he got a montage posted up recently. I don't know if you've seen it. No, no, I've not seen it yet. Okay, well. Um, you know Dark Tongo, the YouTuber. Anyway, he posted a montage of him, but yeah. it, it's it's really good. I'll um have to link that. Yeah. But I'd say that Adam, who's English, um, Tundra and Haddo would be top three. Yeah. Um, I'd say though. Tundra's at the top of that. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. Well, yeah. it goes Tundra first, Haddo second, and then I'd put Adam third. Okay. Um, but Adam has very little team experience, so that's a factor. Um, AD Carry, Toaster, I think, is quite clearly at the top. Yeah. don't think there's any question about that. Nope. Um, following from there, 
it gets a little bit close. I think that it's quite comfortable for Joe to be second. Uh, choke Sadie, Joe Chrism. Yeah. I think that's reasonable. And then third is, honestly, like, I don't even want to comment until I see more. But I, I think it, you know, it could be, it could be Subtomic, for example. Like, depending on how he plays, right? Like, I don't, no one really knows yet. Yeah, yeah. Um, but from what I know, he has good mechanics, so that could shine. But other than that, I'm not really sure. I think that that's just going to be up in the air for now. Um, mid laners is... I mean, not many teams actually have... UK mids, no. Yeah, like the top three. None of the top three have a UK mid. So, outside of that, we're looking at people like Sean, Dynasty, <coughs> um, I don't even know. I actually really don't know. Like, Ramil, for example, Ulfren, um, I, I can't really order them. I guess Ulfren is at the top, even though he's not playing, and then you just slot the others in, I guess. I really don't know. So if you included the EU players, then what would you... Okay. In what uh, order would you put them then? Okay, I'd put Larson at the top. Oh, wait, Cajal's, Cajal's UK, actually. What yeah. am I talking about? Yeah, yeah, he is. Okay, actually, yeah. Okay. Well, Cajal's at the top of the UK. I think that he's, like, joint first with Larson. Yeah. Um, actually, they're all, they're all really exceptional. Like, it actually doesn't do them justice to rank them, but if I had to... Yeah. It would probably be Cage or Larson, then Special. But I think all three of them are like, like so close. Like they, n none of them are like better to better than the other to the point where like you put money on any of them to win versus any of them. You know? Yeah. It, it's quite. It's just like. They're, they're, yeah, they're just so close. But jungler, jungle is like an interesting one because there's actually a lot of good UK junglers right now. Like con compared to, um. A while ago, when it was pretty much just me and Maxlaw, yeah, and uh, Plex. Um, now you've I'm got Impala. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you got Plex, Impala, uh, PJ plays for TCA. He's really good. Um, Dong, Spherian, like all these players are also really good. I think that some of them have like certain champ pool weaknesses. Like, I think Impaler and Plex have a small edge just due to the number of champions that they can play to the same level. Yeah. Whereas, like, PJ and Furion are, like, a little more, like, narrowed in what they'll play to a high level. Um, and top lane is really interesting as well because, again, like, I mean, Alfari is, like, clearly at the top. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then... I think everyone, I, I think everyone is on a similar level from there downwards. You know, looking at the fact that um, actually, no, 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 this is a bit more clear. Rift, I think Rifty is quite comfortable in second from a UK perspective. Um, I think Rifty and Zygoth are probably on a similar level, but obviously Rifty is UK. Um, Zygoth being the top laner for Exiles. Um, and then after that, I really don't know. Um, I think. And there are a lot of people that like I need to see more games from because like they've kind of come out of nowhere. Yeah. Okay. Like Choke's top seems good, but again we've only seen one game, so Yeah, it's, it's difficult, isn't it, with this very, very small sample size. Yeah. Okay. So let's move on to discuss the ESL UK premiership. We'll start off by talking about last week's games. So the first game, well, minus the infused man line one, which obviously got forfeited by infused due to silly circumstances, let's say. Um, mm. There was choke versus TCA. Um, what do you remember about the game, and do you have anything to share about it? Um, choke versus TCA. All I remember is that it was quite a close game up until some fights. <laughs> some fights, yeah. <laughs> so, so I'll just try and refresh your memory then. So the, the comps were um, Malphite, Gragas, Corky, Lucian and Morgana for Choke versus mm -hmm. Nautilus, Rek'Sai, Ari, Caitlyn and Braum for TCA. 
Okay. From what I remember, um, I watched it a little bit before just to refresh my memory. There was a dragon fight around 21 minutes. Um, and yeah. especially with the Corky and Lucian, they had basically just hit their mid game power spike because they, Corky had got his Triforce and Hex Drink just before the fight, and Lucian had literally also just finished his stack shiv after his Essence Reaver. Um, and obviously, I don't think TCA really want to be fighting a fight around that time. And on top of it, they tried to fight twice. Basically, they, they fought once. They, I don't know, they didn't get ace. They, four, four kills went over to, to choke. And straight away, straight after, they respawned. Two players went in. I think it was the top laner and the AD carry. And they basically got murdered <laughs> again. Yeah. Um, it seemed very interesting that TCA were on a lot of gold because then when they died the first time, they bought some core items. Like, um, Caitlyn finished the rapid fire cannon, um, Rek'Sai built Locket, and the Braum finished the face of the mountain. And I'm not saying that these are like core items that they would have needed to win the fight. I don't think they should have took the fight at all, really, but it definitely would have helped. Um, the way that the team fight went, but on top of that as well, Malphite did land an absolutely amazing four man, all and that basically ended that fight from that point. Yeah, I do remember that. <coughs> yeah, um, I think that that's quite a standard mistake to see, really. Yeah. In the um. You know, teams will often not realize when they should and shouldn't fight and things like that. But I think that also it kind of is natural um, to happen sometimes. And it's only it's only one game, so I don't think it shows like a tremendous amount. And I don't think it was like a an incredibly surprising result. Although I am a little bit surprised that um, Choke didn't do so well in the other game. Although they did have um they did have like a mid game spiking comp that isn't that incredibly strong early, but. I th I, I'm obviously, without any bias, I did expect TCA to win. Um, I don't think it's it's too much of a worry, really, considering the, um, the amount of time that they've been together. Um, I don't know how long Choke has been together in terms of being able to like mold together, but TCA has not been around. Well, in that lineup anyway hasn't been around too long, so I'm not too worried. I'm more confident for this week, but we'll go into that in a little bit. So moving on from there, there was Eminem versus Exertus. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, what are your thoughts on Rumble Jungle? Uh, it's just it's a strong pick. Um, it's definitely like a a good alternative. It's like an alternative to Lee, in that if you need like an earlyish game duelist who scales moderately well, like for example, like. Lee scales really poorly on this patch, but as a champion, he doesn't scale poorly, really. It's yeah. most of the items. Yeah. Okay. Like, you know, he's, he's actually, like, good Lee players are still really useful. Um, whereas Rumble has, he's, a, he's not, obviously, he's not, like, an early game powerhouse or anything, but he does pretty well, like, pre sex, and his scaling is pretty good. Like, his scaling is definitely up there as, like, a damage stat. Um, but I think that, I think it's just a standard pick, really, now. Um, it's not being played like a ton or anything, but it's it's got its place in certain comps. Yeah, okay. So just to go on to talk about the actual game itself, the comps, I don't know if you remember them at all, but um, Exertus had Lulu and Cogmore. Mm -hmm. um, and pretty much, yeah. I mean, apart from the fact that no flame, the players in each role are probably significantly better than... Eminem's respective yeah. part. I think the game was basically lost in pick and bans. Like they just had such a good draft that the game was over straight away. Uh, yeah, I mean when you get Lulu Cog first rotation, it's probably not going to be an easy game for the other team. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And then the last game of the day was. I mean, I wasn't around to see this game, so I and I only managed to quickly go over it. But it was FM versus Renegades. Now, what I will say is FM definitely impressed me more than I thought they would have. 
um, mm -hmm. against Renegades anyway. They managed to get a lot of kills against them in the early game. It was just that they weren't able to actually get a gold lead because they um, they were they were out rotated around the map all, all the time. They managed to, like Renegades managed to get towers. They were they had CS leads. So I mean, apart from that, I definitely think FM did better than I expected anyway. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, at the same time, I think it is not going to be an uncommon trend for people to be doing decently versus Renegade Tally. I don't think they're like that much of an early game team. Yeah, okay. So it's it's not the most surprising thing. So, who would you say is the MVP of last week, from what you remember? Um, I've got a clear person that I'm pretty sure. I don't know if you remember about or you would agree, but I'd say special. That game, he went absolutely off on Zed. Yeah, I mean, he made that sick, uh, the outplay mid. Um, the 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 Zed the Zed Greg, uh, where he like jumped over the Gregas. Um, he flashed over Gregasy, like yeah. mid mid two v one. Um, yeah, that was definitely up there. I think it's like that that is like a really respectable player, like probably puts him up there. I think the other one is like maybe um Choke's top laner for the Malphite play. I was gonna but say I mean, Nig as well because he ba it, like the amount of times he just got really good Malphite ults and obviously that Malph this specific one we mentioned before, that basically won them the game. Yeah, I mean it's it's like a it's a crucial role to have in a team, and like he did it right. Um, I think that that's yeah. I mean it's probably up there between him and Special. I mean it, it's just a shame that there wasn't like an extra game to, to have available, and that like Infuse didn't play. So yeah, yeah, of course. So I know it's early days, and even including the the promos for the ESL Premiership, we don't have that many games to have a look. Uh, or look through who would you say or who do you think could potentially get MP MVP of the season hmm. I think it's going to be either it's going to be between Cajal, Special or Toaster I think Yeah, that is my opinion hmm I think if we could throw anyone else into the mix there, because like I I don't think Larson is like a particularly like flashy player, but he's he's like an exceptional player. But I think he plays like more textbook, if that makes sense. Yeah, and that like he he does his job. I'm not saying that these players don't buy. I think specifically Cajal and Special are quite flashy. Like uh, yeah, at least definitely. Cajal when he picks when he picks his aggressive stuff like Ari, like. Um, he's he's like a, he makes really aggressive players and like generally, in in close like carries games in a sense like he plays really solid. But I don't know it's it's gonna be between one of the top three mids or like toaster I think. Yeah, I'm just trying to think. I don't know, I'm off the top of my head. I can't actually think of anyone right now that could potentially fit into that mix of players. Um. So yeah, I think I'd agree with what you're saying there. So. Yeah. Let's go on to next week's games. Oh, well, not next week's. It's tomorrow's games now. Um, first of all, we've got Exertus versus Renegades. Uh, this is, in my opinion, probably <coughs> one of the most important, if not the most important game of the season. Um, mm -hmm. I think whoever wins this game could potentially be like the decider between who becomes first and second. I don't know what your thoughts about this matchup is. Um, I think that's reasonable, but it's important to consider the like example. Um, for Exertus to win uh, Prem, they don't necessarily have to beat Renegades, or like to to win the ladder stage. Yeah. Um, they could lose to Renegades, and then Mana Light could beat Renegades, and then they could beat Mana Light. Um, but it is it is like an important game in terms of like setting the the bar, I guess, or like you know showing who's on top yeah okay. and obviously it's going to have a very large influence in the overall results but um i think that it is not unreasonable to say that mana light can beat renegades too so that's uh, a big factor 
what do you think? Do you think it's better for Exertus to play Renegades now, or well, the each the both teams to play each other now, or do you think it's better for them to have played like say last game of the season when there's more info on each of the teams? Who do you think mm. would have benefited more from saying playing later on and playing now? I think the more time, it's so hard to say. Um, I think in the current moment, it's favourable for Exertus to be playing them at this point. Okay. Um, but aside from that, I, I think that it's quite close. So but I don't think anyone specifically benefits. Yeah. Well, given the format as well, that's why I was obviously... Well, just this this series, I'd say, even though it's just a one game. Like, given the format, I touched upon it a little bit last last week with Dom. What do you think of the... Well, basically, because it's a best of one, what do you think about this? Like... Do you think it should have been a best of two, maybe even a best of three? And what would you say are the benefits and like disadvantages of all? Mm. I think best of ones make little to no sense. Especially considering that there's only four games a week. Yeah. Like four four teams. No, you know, four sets of games. So it makes very little sense to just not have more time invested into them. Um, even if and I, I don't even... I can't quite think of what the reason would be. Maybe they're just so insistent on having the studio in place. Yeah. But you don't necessarily have to run the studio all the time. Like, you could run one... You could run half of your broadcast at the studio and half online. And then just play best of three series. Yeah. And, like, only, only stream from the event bi-weekly. And then do online stream the other week, like if cost is an issue. Yeah. Um, I don't, I don't really see the reasoning because they've put all this money and all this time into running this league, and then the integrity is kind of put into question. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and it's not really, it's not really worth it, in my opinion. From it shouldn't be worth it from ESL's perspective. Like it shouldn't feel okay, but I guess they're fine with that. There's not much anyone can do about it, and it's kind of. I'm not going to say it's pointless to complain because there's nothing else you can do and it's fine to complain. But I think that ESL have shown in the past that they don't really like to change things once they've made their mind up. So Yeah. I mean, especially since, like, how exciting would that series be to see, like, a best of three between Exertus and Renegades? I think that'd be an absolutely Actually, amazing series to watch. Like, all of the games tomorrow are, like, the games, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Like... All of them mean a lot, and all of them are close. Yeah. And as we as we talked about before, you can just cheese strat one game, and then that's it. And you know, I mean, it's like it's not even like double round robin. So you literally play them once. That's it. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's crazy. I went, I went, I went off a little bit last week, so I'm not going to do it again. But it's just insane. Do you think we need like another organization to run a run a tournament where it is maybe best of two or like kind of like a more of a LCS format? Um, yeah, but it's, I mean, hard to have anyone who can challenge what ESL do. But you need, you kind of need ESL to be challenged in order for them to consider making changes. If that makes sense. Yeah. If there's no competition, then why would they change? Because... From their perspective, we should be grateful that they're even running a tournament. If that makes sense. I'm not yeah, saying they think that, but I'm just yeah, saying yeah, that's no, one way to look at it. I, I get it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I am as well, for sure. I just wish mm-hmm. they, um, they had planned it out possibly a little bit better or thought well, like about the, the players. Well, yeah, yeah, like what we want, yeah. yeah. Well, not we, but the, the players, yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay, so moving on from that game anyway... It's FM versus M&M. What mm-hmm. do you think? Who? Well, actually, let's before we before we go into the second game. Who do you think is going to win versus Exertus and Renegades? <coughs> um, I think that I think it's like a fifty-five forty-five in favor of Exertus, but there are many ways that both teams can win. So, I mean, I'm I'm putting I'm putting my bet on Exertus, but I. 
I'm not saying that Exiles will win. I just I think they have the highest chance. Yeah. Even if it is by a few percent. Mm. Before last week, I would have said Renegades had it in the bag. Um, although after seeing how well FM managed to play in the early game against them, I'm not so sure. So, if I had to make a decision, I'm just going to say Renegades just to do the opposite of you. <laughs> I'm going to say Renegades, but only just. Like, I'm talking 1 or 2% favour in terms of going towards Renegades. Did you uh, did you know that they played in fives? Did they? They they played ranked fives, Renegades versus Exodus. Uh, didn't know. Who who won? Exodus. Well, I'm still sticking with Renegades, so <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It's fine. You did not have that information. I'm, at I'm the not time, going to so change it's... my mind. Um, it's okay. So yeah, FM <coughs> versus M and M. Who do you think is gonna win this matchup? Um, I think FM are going to win, but again, it's by, it, it's a close game. Like I think that FM are like the, the slight favourites, or not not as slight as the Exodus game, but I think it's like maybe a 60-40, 65-35 kind of thing. Okay. Well, and I don't want to seem like I'm actually just going to the opposite of you, but I actually was thinking yeah. in terms, I was, I was thinking it'd probably be M&M, so... And we're probably going to go to the opposite for the next game as well, actually, just thinking about it, but that's obvious. Wait, what, what's, what's the next game? Infuse versus TCA. Oh, yeah, we're going opposite, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, although that, that one is, like, super close in my mind. Like, that's a complete, like, 50-50 from my perspective. Although, I don't know, actually. Um... I, I I really don't know. I, it's hard to just predict. I mean, I I do. I guess I think Infuse will win, but I'm not gonna be at all remotely surprised if TCA win. Yeah, I mean, I think we've improved a lot over <coughs> the last week, so that's why I'd say it definitely tips in our favour. And without being cocky, I think it's more of like seventy thirty in in terms of our uh, like in our favour. But of course, I'm gonna say that. <laughs> yeah. So uh, no, no, no bias, of course. No bias whatsoever. <laughs> I mean, if I was playing, it would literally be a hundred percent in our favor. But you know, yeah. Um, yeah. Moving on. Choke versus Manolite is the last game. Yep. And what do you think about this one? Uh, I, I actually again, Manolite are the favorites, but it's not surprising if Choke win, in my opinion. I like it's. It's yeah. like, what is, in my mind, the fourth team playing against the third team? Which is like, either of them can win. I'd agree with one, like, winning, so yeah, we'll agree with that one. So, what do you think your predictions, and again, I know we've only had one um, game to go off, but what do you think your predictions are for, basically, the final standings of the group stages, so to speak? I should probably just uh, recite my tweet. Yeah, yeah. Um. So first, first place I think will be Exodus. Second, Renegades. Third, Mana Light. Fourth, Choke. Um. Fifth, FM. Sixth, Infused. M and M. Seventh, and TCA. Eighth. Yep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, we, we had a chat about this yesterday on Twitter for anyone who didn't see, and I said that. I would bet, or I would put money on the fact that TCA will finish top four, and we're going for twenty pound, and we're also going to go for whatever the next I series after that, which prob might be the winter <coughs> one actually. No, no, it, no, it won't. It'll be the the August one, won't it? Providing I ever go to one, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> the loser will have to call. Well, every time they see them. We'll have to call the other one Lord for the for the entire event and on any Twitter social interactions. So I'm just confirming the bet here so everyone can see that we've made the bet and neither of us can back down from it. Mm -hmm. And just like a final note, 
what do you think about renegades like a lot of them like a lot of people probably the majority of people i think have them pitted to be first like i know you've said that you think exerts could beat them tomorrow and they have obviously in the rank fives um mm-hmm. do you think anyone else can beat them yeah i think man i like can um i think choke can i don't think it's too far out for them to be beat like they're not if they had i don't know i don't know what to say really like they're definitely beatable but they're not i'm not making out that they're bad or anything like they're a team that still like should like as in as far as expectations go they should finish first yeah i just happen to think that they won't even though they do have the on paper like better roster than most teams yeah okay so like <coughs> what do you think is their weaknesses to to basically allow other teams to beat them uh, i really really don't want to comment because okay. like it's something that i i don't know like i'm not saying i've got it figured out because i really don't but yeah. um I, I think there are certain things that maybe they're not aware of that obviously yeah um yeah yeah okay. but again i'm not saying that there's some like gaping holes or anything because they really aren't they're like a, they're a good team it's just that i think that there's like ways that teams like could beat them where like maybe other teams don't have that the same weakness yeah okay so one final question then before we finish off and um, someone in the chat asked what do you think of the uk scene at the moment and do you think the uk scene will change and if so what needs to happen to make it change for the better mm-hmm. i guess again i have an opinion that it's i think it's like peaked and went down and now it's at like its secondary peak yeah. If if that makes sense. Yeah, so it's yeah, at a agree. peak that's lower than its prior peak. Yeah. And I think that it's unlikely. To, it's, there's not really many ways that it can improve because there's no incentive to invest money. Like, there's no reason to put that much money into it. Like what what do you really get out of it? And let's say, let's say tomorrow I have like I get given five thousand pounds to run a tournament, and let's say I put. I end up only no. Let's say I, I get like giving like twelve k or something, and the prize pool is five. Um, I am gonna pull in like sixty viewers on stream, and I'm gonna do all of this stuff, and I'm basically gonna get nothing out of it. I'm gonna I'm gonna lose twelve grand, and I'm gonna get next to nothing. Yeah. There's no return. Like there's no consistency. There's nothing that happens. There's no there's like from a business perspective, there's actually no reason to do it other than for fun. And that's why a lot of companies actually do it. Yeah. Like, they do it for fun, and they do it to, like, ESL being an exception, but ESL are so different (coughs) because they're not a standalone company. Like, what they do in running stuff for the UK reflects well on their company and all the other areas of what they do. Yeah. And it all, like, coincides and works together, so it's fine. It's, It's much different from their perspective. Because, obviously, like, they... ESL are so big compared to any other esports company generally. Yeah. So what kind of things, well, do you think people are just not interested or do you think no one's trying hard enough to basically market to try and find these people who might be interested in watching Law UK Pros or do you, do you think people just don't think they're good enough? Why would they watch them when they could watch like EU, LCK, NA? Um, I think that it's a combination of what you said about like LCK, EU and stuff, and that people do prefer to watch that, but it's also that people don't really have like a, a sense of pride in watching their country win things. Um, if you look at like the home scenes in other countries like Spain and Portugal and stuff, um, Turkey, Russia, they have like really big followings to their own scene. Because they have the people that have like an emotional like attachment to their country being good at things, whereas um, and again I'm not I'm not trying I'm trying not to generalize too much I'm I'm just saying that for the most part people in the UK um, don't really have the same same attachment they don't really care about that kind of stuff generally like they don't care about the UK being good at something you know yeah like, it just doesn't matter to them and we have such a cultured and like 
broad society of overall anyway and that like you know it's just it's hard to have an attachment to your own country's flag in the way that like the spanish people want to see like a spanish team in lcs and you know like with other countries as well it just doesn't exist so people just don't really get attached to the individuals or like they don't care and that that's fine like there's nothing wrong with that it's kind of natural but yeah. I, I don't think it's too surprising and it's been that way forever and I don't think it's ever going to change. I don't think there's anything you can do to change that. You can't make people care about something that they just don't really mind about. I mean, it's interesting, really, because if you think about it, if you look at, say, the the Law UK groups, a lot of people join these groups, but they don't yeah. seem to ever really get involved. So it's kind of like, why are they even joining? Like, if you look at, obviously, if you think about the... The ratio in terms of how many people actually post compared to how many people are actually in the group like it's such a small minority um yeah i think but i think again it's like most people just join for the sake of it like for example let's say you're like a casual counter-strike player like you join just to maybe read the occasional post about something yeah or like you join because like oh i play league and i'm from the uk like why not just press <laughs> yeah, join. yeah 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 yeah. Um, and I think that that's that's quite common with like with social media now anyway. Like everything, so like people just I guess there's nothing wrong with it. I'm not like discrediting. I'm just saying like people. I'm not saying it's bad, but people just click on everything and that like, oh like I fit this click like I you know like on Twitter like you see someone that plays league. Oh I play league. Follow you know. Yeah yeah yeah. Okay cool. Yeah that makes sense. Just well I guess you said that you don't think there's any way. I mean there must be some way that we can get people more involved or more on board i mean i don't know i don't have the i like the answer because if i did i'd be shouting about it to get everyone on board but i'm just thinking i don't know maybe i i do think that there's a lack of like advertising in terms of actually getting people to to watch these events because if you think about say the Birmingham meetup for Worlds on the Friday, there were like 500, 600 people there. Yeah, I know they're watching like the, the top, top <coughs> competition, but surely if that was advertised really well, surely if we did that same kind of advertisement, we'd be able to get people to, to watch our games. I'm, I'm, like, I'm just sure, like, there's say there's like King of the North as well, which is next Wednesday, maybe like, 200, 300 people can be there at any point, but throughout the day, I imagine somewhere between 500 and 600 people show up again and online people watch it. And this is just two university teams playing, but again, because they advertise it so well, people come and watch. So do you think it could be just an advertising issue? Um, Kind of. I mean, okay, so advertising is one aspect, but there is something to note that's from the past. Um, I'm just going to read out two things, okay? So, I'm on the pages now. At Insomnia 49, um, there were 89 teams in total that entered the League of Legends tournament. Yeah. Like, 89 teams on LAN in this tournament. At Insomnia 50, there were 28. But to be fair, Insomnia 50 was the winner one, was it not? Yeah. So, there's then it's a trend. Yeah, but it but it continues. It just it just continues. It never like fifty one thirty eight. It will never. It will ne like from the point on after forty nine. It. Pr I don't think it ever broke past like forty five teams ever yeah, again. No, I don't think it's been anywhere as close as I forty nine. So, what do you think the reasoning could be behind that? I think that the scene is too elitist. Um, most of the people who played casually and were like the the bronze teams, um, like you know, like the the teams that, I mean, there were so many teams were like bronze and silver at forty nine, yeah, like so many, but they were going there to play games and drink and have fun, but you kind of get laughed at for that in league, yeah. Like the teams will just stomp you in twenty minutes, and oh, it's also that when you play league, um, our land against the better teams. You you get behind in the first two minutes, and then you have to sit there and watch yourself lose for twenty minutes. Yeah, yeah. Whereas let's compare it to Counter Strike, where I'm going with my friends. We're all silver, elite, whatever. 
and we're against like um, FM in the first round, even though we're getting 16 owed, like we still get every round to play. Yeah, yeah. You know, and every every three rounds after we eco, we get to buy guns and use the guns. We get yeah. to actually play the game. With League, you don't get to play the game. Yeah, you join the game, yeah. like it's over, you know. Yeah, once you're behind, that's it. It's against. Those you don't teams, even get to play. Yeah. yeah. They literally they'll tower dive you like four minutes in, and that's it. Game over. GG. Pack up your bags. Yeah. 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 You might as well just sit at the fountain and not have fun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I mean, hmm. isn't that meant like um like a mentality thing though? I mean, even playing against. But, like teams that are significantly better than me, I can still have fun against them because it's it's just really funny. <coughs> like I played against the Suba, which is a Czech team, or yeah, I know they them, were yeah. a Czech team, yeah. Um, and I played against oh, what's his name now? He's a really popular streamer. I know the Suba uh, guys. I mean, I don't know them, but I know who you mean. They have a streamer. It on begins with H. I can't remember. They're like Hayden or something like that. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And yeah, I remember. Harden, like, Harden. H- that's it. Yeah, 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 yeah. And basically, when we played against them, I just remember going, right, guys, if we can last 25 minutes, then we've won. Like, in our, not, not that we've won, but like, we've just yeah, yeah. won because we managed to last that long. And we managed to last 27 minutes. And for us, it was just hilarious because we got absolutely dumpstered by them. It was just. An absolute like mockery. Like we probably got like two kills or something, and they got like thirty. But it was just fun to play against them. And yeah, we didn't really take anything away from the game because at the time, and this was like season two or something. I think I was like gold player or something. So I, of course I didn't take anything away from it. But it was just really fun to play. So I think yeah, I get what you're saying. It is quite elitist, and people do mock each other, especially when they beat them. I mean, even at the top, and we've said before, infused in. FM or let's say FM and choke or infuse and choke like that trio they always like not flame but like trash talk people like each other before the the match to kind of hype it up. Mhm. So I yeah, I mean, but it's also that like you're not seen as like you're not treated as an equal if you're like a silver team mostly. Like a lot of teams will like buy like six tiers and troll pick and like run yeah, around and yeah, troll you yeah, yeah, yeah. and like um just to like show that they're superior whereas again if you're looking counter-strike like they'll just kind of win and then like they don't like i don't know how to put it it's like league just in general league breeds people to have like bigger egos and like flaunt themselves more i'm not saying this doesn't exist in other scenes but it's definitely less dominant in like counter-strike for example yeah you know, just Counter Strike is the prime example because it is the community esport in the UK, like the most played like community thing that goes on at events. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty. Do you think that could possibly be like a factor as well? Then, with with the <coughs> like coming of CS:GO, and it's so big for the UK scene, and so many teams join. Do you think some of the teams that used to play League of Legends have gone on to play CS:GO instead? Yeah, they have. Like, it's it's definitely like not uncommon at all. Um, there's just more appeal to it as a casual like LAN person, mm. a person who just goes to LANs. There's almost no incentive to play League, like unless you really find it that fun. There's just no reason. And like, yeah. what would you like? Would you? I can't remember. At I49. Maybe you can. Was the intermediate tournament on? Yeah, there was. Well, okay. I was gonna say maybe like the community events also took away from the from the main tournament because like all the bronze and silver maybe gold teams would have joined that instead but okay um it definitely helps but it doesn't you still within all these gold teams playing each other it's still not like it's still not that rewarding or that fun like league in itself is just a stressful game yeah yeah like that it's quite rare that people can play without being stressed no matter what level they're at I'm not saying, and again, I'm not saying that CS isn't like this, but it's definitely less so. Definitely. I mean, I'm just trying to think, what game could you compare League to that bur- like burns people out constantly? The amount of breaks I have to take in a year, like at the moment, I've just come back from like a two-month break <coughs> because yeah. I was burnt out. 
and in the middle of last year and at the start of last year I had to take a month both times to because I was burnt out because of how stressful it is like, I don't think there's any other game that I've ever played for as long as this like MMOs like four years at a time that I would just stop at any point apart from like mm-hmm. the day when I've quit because I don't it's not stressful like it's just uh, that's fun to play like league is definitely so stressful it's because you're forced to like once you're losing you're forced to watch yourself lose and you can't do anything about it you have to keep playing whereas everything else is quite quite quick and moderately painless yeah like cs you're losing rounds sure but every round is fresh and you get to like keep playing (coughs) there aren't many things that are similar to it actually it's like a unique form of torture yeah i mean it's (laughs) to to make an analogy League is literally like being starved to death when you're behind because you have, I mean, yeah. that's what people use anyway. You, you've been starved of the resources in the game until you die, aka the, <coughs> the Nexus dies. Yeah. Whereas, like other games, it's not just not the case at all. Well, you have to watch, you have to like watch the food while you can't eat it basically because you watch the other team beat you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, definitely. All right. Well, I did say that would have been the last question, like five questions ago, but that I think that that's a good place to to finish off there. So thanks for coming on today, Billy. And as always, okay. thanks to everyone who tuned in today for another episode of Talking Esports. Of course, feel free to follow both me and Billy on Twitter. Our handles are below. And you can also follow TCA on social media. Just search for TCA Esports on either Twitter, Facebook, or YouTube. And next Tuesday at 7 p.m., we'll be having Sonar on to discuss his casting career and to talk about uh, like how to get into casting. And he'll be providing some inspiration in that regard. So thanks again, everyone, and see you all next week.